Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. I, I am honored to be here, and I want to start by saying thank you. God bless you for what you do every day across our country, working in states to help protect, protect and expand freedom, opportunity, and the rule of law, the founding ideas of our country that have been under assault. But I'm, I'm honored to be here among you. I'm going to talk a little bit about energy. I'll probably talk really quickly because I only have a certain amount of time. I'll be around a little bit later for anyone. Come grab me for questions or follow up. But I'm going to hit really three points. Number one, energy matters. Number two, energy is hard. And number three, climate change may not be exactly what you think it is. It's a real thing, but it's actually sort of a slow moving, in our lifetimes, relatively modest phenomenon that's just been wildly abused for political reasons. And the, but the cost of that is enormous in human lives and human opportunity. Energy matters. Look, the, the basics we all know, it powers our cars, our homes, our businesses, our farms, our factories. It's used to make the whole outfit I'm wearing, all these walls and all the materials this building. This all comes from energy. I, I named our company when we founded it 13 years ago, Liberty Energy for a reason. Global life expectancy at birth was about 30 years, 20,000 years ago, before the invention of agriculture. Global life expectancy at birth was about 30 years, 200 years ago, after the founding of our country. It was higher here. It was in the high 30s in the United States, but still 30 years globally. I think two things changed to make life expectancy today at birth globally 73 years. The, really the spread of human liberty, bottom up social organization. I could go found a company and just pay a small fee and incorporate. Until the 1840s in the United Kingdom and the US, really the birthplace of freedom, you, before the 1840s you needed government approval to get limited liability. Otherwise, if your business failed, you went to debtor prison. You don't get a lot of entrepreneurship in that setting. This, this explosion of human liberty changed the game. The other thing that changed the game was the explosion in available energy. And really, it was hydrocarbons. It was coal at first. I'm one of the rare oil and gas guys who celebrates coal. It's the biggest source of global electricity for 70 years and it will be for decades more. Coal, then oil, then natural gas, just change the human condition, you know, just beyond imagination. There's no modern medicine, there's no internet, there's no telecommunications, there's no people flying from around the country to hold a conference like this without hydrocarbons. It's just, nobody likes to talk about it, but it's just true. I, I, in this book, I wrote a book last winter called Bettering Human Lives. There'll be a few of them at your tables. It's long, it's nerdy, it's full of data, but it's got case studies, it's got examples, you can read it in pieces. But the affordability and the availability of energy is the biggest constraint on the quality of life of people wherever you live. California's gone ridiculous on energy. They've made it expensive and unreliable. So what happened? All the energy intensive manufacturing left the state. If you're a rich tech or advertising executive, um, you may have a great life there. I, I lived in San Francisco for almost 20 years, embarrassed to say that. But it was an awesome city. I'm a mountain biker, adventure guy. I had a great lifestyle. But it has the highest adjusted poverty rate of any state in the nation. You know why? If you restrict freedom and you restrict, restrict energy, you just constrain everyone's opportunities and you make, life, you make life smaller and rougher and more difficult. Europe has been doing the same thing for 20 years. They followed just really a nuts, never penciled out energy policy and they've just crushed the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. 
You know, the United Kingdom and Germany have just outsourced all of their energy intensive manufacturing, enfeebled their economies. I, I wrote a piece a year or so ago, since the financial crisis and the shale revolution really booming in the United States, in dollar terms, per capita income in our country has grown by over 70%. In Europe, it's grown by 6%. You make energy expensive, you crush your economies. The, in, in their local currency terms, their economy grew faster than that, still much slower than ours, but their, the value of their goods, their buying power just shrunk. And, and, and look, you see political upheaval and people very, very upset across the continent of Europe. There's, there's a reason for that. Shrinkage of human liberty and making energy more expensive and less reliable. It's just game changing. So a few things about energy being hard. Well, I, I should start with myself. I grew up here in the early 1980s. There was a mania then that the world was coming to the end and hydrocarbons were the bad guys then too. Uh, and then it was that we were gonna run out of hydrocarbons and land and fertilizer and therefore the world was gonna, our best days were gonna be behind us, industrial civilization was collapsing. I had a professor from CU Boulder come speak at my high school. Pretty, pretty scary story. And I was a young, I'd, I'd gotten over that I was gonna be a professional tennis player, so I was gonna be a scientist. Super interested in astronomy. You know, what powers the stars and how can we look up in the sky and see stuff that's quadrillions of miles away with our naked eye. Like something's going on in those stars. And so when, they, when, when I was told that energy supply was gonna collapse and the world was gonna, was gonna re regress, I, I went to MIT. I grew up in the mountains here in Colorado. I went back to Cambridge, Massachusetts because they had these two devices called tokamaks that looked like the most promising way to develop fusion energy. If we're running out of energy, I want to be part of the solution. Uh, I got there and realized I didn't have the patience for big science, I'm gonna be an entrepreneur. I ended out making another mistake and going to UC Berkeley for graduate school. And while there, I worked on solar energy. I studied electrical engineering, but I worked on solar energy. You know, to me, and I, I say it today, I don't care where energy comes from, as long as it's affordable, reliable, secure, and betters human lives, that's what I'm about. Thank you. But it turns out that's a tough challenge. That's a tough challenge. I went back, and you've got to do that, you've got to take that data from energy suppliers, and then there's always a little bit of corruptions in the data. I write about that. It's discussed in this book, Bettering Human Lives. But in very round numbers, the Yom Kippur War, 1973, the start of the fear of oil security. Uh, at that point in time, 85% of global energy came from hydrocarbons 50 years ago. I went to work on nuclear. I went to work on solar. After graduate school, I worked on geothermal. I met a gal when I was 18. She's a grandmother now. We had our first grandchild six weeks ago. But yeah, luckiest thing in my life, this gal and now this grandson. But the, be, be, a missed paycheck, this wonderful gal, and that's how I got into oil and gas as a consultant in graduate school. But 80, so. 50 years ago, 85% of global energy came from hydrocarbons. Do you know what the number is today? 85%. Actually, zero change in market share. The world consumes 125% more energy. People's lives have continued to get better. And we've developed other energy resources, but just remarkably, remarkably little. That's because energy is hard but it matters. So in that 50 year period, global demand for energy has grown 1.6% compound annual growth rate. If people's are, lives are getting better, it means they're consuming more energy. In the last 20 years, de demand for energy has grown 1.7% compound annual growth rate. So almost the same, but a little bit higher. This belief that soon we're gonna hit peak demand for energy and everything's gonna change, like nothing in the data shows that. Last point on energy consumption. People in this room, I, I call the lucky one billion. There's eight billion people on the planet. 
and a billion of us transport on motorized transport, not all of us own cars, but we ride buses, we fly on planes or trains, motorized transport, we, we, we turn on a light switch in our house, we flush our toilets, we live great lifestyles. That's one billion people, one billion. We consume on average 13 barrels of oil per person per year, 13. The other seven billion people in the world who don't have motorized transport, don't just turn on the lights in their house, don't have easy access to modern medicine and all the things that have changed our world, they consume three barrels of oil per person per year. What, what do you think those seven billion people aspire to? Every one of them. They wanna be in this room and living the lifestyles we live and, and God willing and with our efforts, they will. But it means they're gonna consume more energy and they need that energy. The, the one truly transformative thing that happened in energy in my lifetime was the shale revolution. Right in the district of Senator Phil King, under the northern suburbs of Fort Worth, Texas, um, just in very much a blind squirrel finds nut, myself and a couple colleagues had some ideas and George Mitchell was innovative. He was trying, he'd been trying since 1982 to figure out how to get natural gas out of this shale layer that was below the Strawn formation he was producing conventional natural gas from. And Blind Squirrel Finds Nut, on the third try, it worked. And then nat U.S. natural gas production that had been declining, gas prices were high, we were building import terminals, all of a sudden the game changed. Since then, the United States, even in the early 2000s, was the largest importer of oil in the world by far. Today, China is. Today, we're a net exporter of oil, net exporter of oil and the products made out of oil. And for natural gas, the story is even more dramatic. We were the largest importer of natural gas of any country on the planet. Actually, just 20 years ago, today, we're the largest net exporter of natural gas on the planet. O only recently passing Russia for that title of largest exporter. So last energy fact, 2.2 billion people, think about that, well more than a quarter of humanity, they cook their daily meals and heat their homes, burning wood and dung and sometimes agricultural waste or charcoal, solid biomass inside their homes or huts. That indoor air pollution kills three million people every year. Nearly the de annual death rate of COVID at its peak. We shut down the world foolishly and ridiculously for COVID because it was rich people in rich countries dying and politicians just seized that opportunity. Three million people die every year, but they're low income people in low income nations and most people don't even know about it. That's an eminently solvable problem. It's a, it's a propane cook stove and a propane canister. For a dollar a day, you can just transform the lives of the poorest among us. I, we, we launched a foundation called the Bettering Human Lives Foundation mentioned in this book to tackle that problem. But what you can tackle is energy sobriety. Everything in life has trade-offs. There's no clean energy, there's no dirty energy, there is no energy transition going on. This is just this crazy term. I, I wish it was true, man. I, I'm, I'm on the board of a nuclear, a small modular reactor nuclear company. It just went public. I want to see more energy from anywhere we can that's affordable and reliable and can change lives. But that is a very hard problem. We don't have new energy sources that work and that are affordable and reliable. Forcing unaffordable, unreliable sources impoverishes people, shrinks opportunity, and just exports industry out of our country. But I'll end with that final point. What, what is this misunderstanding of energy meant geopolitically for the United States? We're awash in energy now. That's awesome. It is economically transformative. We have lower cost energy, more abundant. But over the last 20 years, we exported most of our energy intensive manufacturing, mostly to China, but also elsewhere in South Asia. 
I'm for economic development everywhere, so don't, I'm not necessarily bashing China, but everything today that takes a lot of energy to make, think cement and steel and aluminum, plastics, these are dominantly made in China, and they're made with Chinese coal. So that's not a climate policy if you export your industry from a natural gas burning factory in the US to a coal power plant in Asia or Vietnam or Indonesia or China. That's not a climate policy. That's not a clean air policy. That's just a deindustrialization poverty, a reducing opportunity impoverishing Americans policy. I'll end there, but God bless what you do. I'll be around for, for the next hour if you have questions or a dialogue. Take a look at those books on your thing. Just read the little bit at the start. I'm sorry, I'm a nerdy guy, but hopefully it will fire you up that energy matters and that it's, it's not only matters for human lives, it's a winning political position. No one wants expensive gasoline to fill their tanks. No one wants to struggle to afford to pay their heating bills or to have their electricity go out or their company to leave because the energy system stinks in their state. These are winning issues and they matter. Thank you all so much.